For several months now, we've been seeing strange pulse wave patterns emanating from Antarctica that appear to be feeding into our jet stream. And there are a lot of theories about what's really going on down there because for all intents and purposes, most of Antarctica is closed off to the general public. But after all we've read about it, the only thing that we're really sure of is that the majority of everyone has never been told the full story of what is really happening down there. But this is something we came across during our research for the Antarctica video that we put together. It's another breadcrumb we've been left with. What people don't realize today about weather modification and control is that this was something being openly discussed and widely celebrated during the Cold War, especially in the late 50s and throughout the 60s. Full control of the Earth's climate was an openly stated goal right alongside space travel when they first started talking about all these things that they were going to be able to do after World War II. Walt Disney even made one of his propaganda films about it. In the world of tomorrow, weather control will enrich and safeguard our daily lives. On the ground, chemical cloud seeders begin to work the two storm areas. Robot planes seed the clouds from above. These artificial clouds will block the sun from evaporating more water. All available forces have been brought into play. Now we can only watch and wait. By the 1957-58 geophysical year, which centered around internationally cooperative Antarctica-based research, at least four dozen weather research stations were being operated in Antarctica by 11 different nations. And in reports on the findings of the geophysical year, Antarctic scientists were announcing a new belief that the whole world's weather is a single closed circuit. And being the greatest manufacturer of cold air on the planet, Antarctica could be used as one huge world weather control station to change everything from the pattern of the seasons to the levels of the seas by manipulating the vast thicknesses of the ice down there through solar or nuclear power. By the 50s, widespread experimentation was already underway in Antarctica to achieve the goal of weather and climate control. Dr. Harry Wexler is still considered one of the preeminent meteorologists of the 20th century. The MIT-trained director of research at the U.S. Weather Bureau and chief U.S. scientist of the 5758 International Geophysical Year in Antarctica had already come up with several ideas about how governments and militaries could control the planet's weather. A 1959 Hartford Current article discussed Wexler's plan for clearing the Arctic Ocean of all ice and making travel from New York to the Orient much faster by detonating 10 hydrogen bombs under the water and blowing enough steam into the polar sky to blanket the ocean with an ice fog that would drastically cut the amount of heat escaping the ocean and thus prevent new ice from being able to form there. But he was worried the plan would actually drown many famous ports across the world and throw the whole planet into a new ice age, so they weren't sure if they wanted to do it or not. Wexler also discussed firing off hydrogen bombs to rip hurricanes apart and launching a fine powder into equatorial orbit like the rings of Saturn around Earth to shade it from the sun. Sound familiar? It should. They've only been discussing doing it for years. 10 Gulfstream jets outfitted with special engines that allow them to fly safely around the stratosphere at an altitude of 70,000 feet take off from a runway near the equator and their cargo includes thousands of pounds of a chemical compound. By 1962, however, Dr. Wexler was singing a different tune on weather modification. His new calculations worried him that rocket fuels of the type the world's militaries had been firing off into the atmosphere in all manner of experiments, weather and otherwise, since the end of World War II, was possibly permanently affecting the climate and irreparably changing the world's weather for the worse. Throughout 1962, he delivered a speech titled On the Possibilities of Climate Control to at least three different groups across the country on how the residues of rocket fuels, including chlorine and bromine compounds, were contaminating the upper atmosphere, not just by destroying the ozone layer, 
but by punching holes in the ionosphere. James Fleming of Colby College points out that Wexler was concerned not just about industrial pollution of the lower atmosphere, but that planetary scale manipulation of the Earth's shortwave and longwave radiation budget would result in, quote, rather large scale effects on general circulation patterns in short or longer periods, even approaching that of climate change, end quote. In other words, Wexler was saying that these rocket fuel compound residues were causing what could eventually be permanent climate change. And by the way, as Fleming points out, our modern history of ozone depletion only really dates back to the 70s. That's when they started talking about that as being an issue and a problem that we were facing. It's also a good time to point out that by 1962, when Wexler was saying this, the U.S. military, USSR, and others had been not only detonating rockets in the atmosphere for various science and military experiments, including hundreds of sounding rockets from Antarctica, but they were also reportedly blowing up nuclear warheads in the upper atmosphere, including top-secret high-altitude nuclear testing operations Hardtack and Argus in 1958, and Operation Fishbowl, which had just begun in 1962 when Wexler began making these claims. Wexler noted that the effects could be temporary, but he also said these compounds could be left behind as a catalyst that could cause permanent climate and weather changes. He warned of, quote, a growing anxiety that, quote, man, in applying his growing energies and facilities against the power of the winds and storms, may do so with more enthusiasm than knowledge and so cause more harm than good. There had also been some suggestion that the world's militaries could use this kind of knowledge to wage geophysical warfare by purposefully attacking the ozone layer over an enemy country. Wexler spent 1962 warning against man's attempt to control the climate and the weather, and that rocket fuels could be doing irreversible damage to the planet's climate. This was a man who was sitting on every relevant scientific advisory board on weather and weather research, that the U.S. had at the time. He was working alongside the likes of John von Neumann, and he'd been writing papers on weather control for JFK. So he knew what he was talking about, or at least he should have, and now he was publicly warning against one of the U.S. military's biggest stated goals and biggest justifications for the scientific takeover of Antarctica, where the majority of rocket launches and weather experimentation was taking place at that time. Wexler obviously told the DoD all about his concerns because he was quoted in the Daily Press in February 1962 as saying, The most heartening thing is that the Department of Defense has ordered an investigation of the possible side effects. These fuels are so new that no one knows much about their effect. Sadly though, that speech on the possibilities of climate control that he gave in 1962, warning about the potentially permanent negative effects of detonating all these rockets and bombs off in the Earth's atmosphere, and what that was doing to the world's weather and climate, would be the last speech that Harry Wexler would ever give. In August 1962, Dr. Harry Wexler suffered a heart attack at the age of 51 while on vacation in Woods Hole, Massachusetts and died at a Boston hospital a week later. That speech would have normally been published, but due to his untimely death, it never was. A 1962 publication titled Antarctic Research, which includes papers presented to the 10th Pacific Science Congress and bears Wexler's name as editor, was published posthumously in 1962 and features a memorial about him, but makes no mention of his startling findings earlier that year. Even more curious, the first international symposium on rocket and satellite meteorology was held in April of 1962 when he was still alive and was organized in part by him. Surely he had mentioned his findings there at that symposium, except nothing about his speech or his comments on this matter is mentioned in the final publication of the symposium, which also bears a memorial to Wexler. Eerily, a Rand Corporation man paraphrases Wexler's remarks on opening the symposium regarding man's endeavor to push higher into the atmosphere with his instruments. It's unbelievable that Wexler would not have mentioned the fact that he discovered those very instruments could be permanently screwing up the Earth's climate at that symposium. Weather modification experiments continued unabated, as did rocket and bomb tests. 
The year after Wexler died and the day after JFK was assassinated, it quietly came out after multiple government denials that a nuclear weapon had been fired in supposedly peaceful Antarctica for reasons the public was never told. The National Academy of Sciences that same year appointed a panel on weather and climate modification to, quote, undertake a deliberate and thoughtful review of the present status and activities in this field and its potential and limitations for the future. The following year, 1964, the director of National Science Foundation announced the appointment of a special commission on weather modification. And by 1966, NASA Administrator Homer Newell completed a report to the Interdepartmental Committee for Atmospheric Sciences titled A Recommended National Program in Weather Modification, which advocated direct modification of the weather to include lightning suppression efforts, which if you think about it, just seems like a really bad idea that would disrupt the electrical balance of the atmosphere, and that's just for starters. Even Newell admitted in his own report that their weather modification experiments had shown, quote, changes in species, which led to, quote, considerable uncertainties relative to specific results of weather modification. In other words, all of the stuff that the Club of Rome began blaming on the rest of us in the 1970s, everything from ozone depletion to climate change to negatively impacting the flora and the fauna, can also be traced back to widespread government weather modification experimentation and military rocket and nuclear bomb testing dating back to the 50s and 60s and warned about by Dr. Harry Wexler just before his untimely death in 1962. Today, we see things like this. Buildings have collapsed. There are reports from New Orleans of uh, people trapped in buildings that have come down around them. Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, has been hit by a major earthquake. Earthquake in Japan, a powerful quake. The tsunami has engulfed several cities. This is the moment Japan's nuclear disaster began. Interrupt regular programming to bring you this weather alert. There is a tornado on the ground in the southern portions of Joplin, just to the south of our station here. We're told all the time that human beings are the cause for all the environmental woes, and thus we have no other choice than to turn over our trust to the government for global geoengineering experiments to commence. And although we will likely never be told how far weather modification and control experimentation went, or where those experiments are at today, when you see something like this coming up from Antarctica, just realize that they've only been talking about using that still mostly off-limits continent for planetary weather control since the 1950s, and warnings against the possible irreparable damage of widespread weather modification and geoengineering from someone who was there during all of that early experimentation and who went down in history as one of the greatest meteorologists the U.S. has ever had, were ignored.